when the person six cycles their lawn where they're putting it into a pattern of stress then recovery what happens is that you also establish patterns of hyperactive weather in that the area and region in general doesn't have enough rooted plant and fertile soil to convert solar radiation to cellulose when needed because of fluctuations in solar intensity from atmospheric conditions or solar flares. So what happens is absent that ability to quell that temperature or radiation, those energies build and build until they have to abate in the form of extreme weather. Um, unfortunately too, the plants have a memory. So when they, rem when they have that memory or recollection of being cut short below the, you know, not within the margin that lets them uh, express in a way that their DNA calls for. The reaction in the plants that some might term memory is to downregulate gene hormone expression for, or gene hormone signaling for stoma, rese uh, stomatocyte receptors. So it's compounding because without the stomatocyte receptor density on these plants, then you lose a great deal of your conversion from of carbon dioxide to oxygen, which abates some of that heat um, because oxygen is a non-greenhousing gas and carbon dioxide is. So that's a, a, a multiplier that also contributes to the drought, drought storm cycle. But additionally, just the fact that you don't have as much surface area on the plant in the in the lines of looking at it from a physics standpoint give you less surface area to collect dew and then retain that moisture because of self-shading or pear shading until later in the day where it can give off evaporation and trigger and contribute to precipitation cycles so there again without the precipitation either from being burned off in the atmosphere because of the damage from mowing of our atmosphere in general in gas composition or from damage to our weather through affecting the evaporation precipitation cycle, these negative consequences result in the inability of the ecosystem to do micro corrections for constantly fluctuating conditions and as a result the only thing it can do is macro corrections in the form of storms energy doesn't dissipate it changes forms um, it can be a daily precipitation cycle if you manage your lands correctly or it can be um, detrimental and another compounding factor is when you get a storm the suddenness of all that precipitation can wash away your nutrients no matter how much you've tried to keep them in place you know so now it compounds again so that area when it's been damaged by the water erosion and the washing away of the nutrients now is in a less favorable position to establish that symbiosis that it could have had if it was mowed at the proper height so all of these factors come to play and so many of them are compounding that if you think it makes little to no difference when you consider the multipliers in these factors that compound it um there's little room for debate as to how important it is to mow the lawn in a fashion that is close enough to its genetic expression that it doesn't trigger these down regulation of hormone signaling for stomat stomatocyte receptors or even it can be done on uh, 
uh, downregulation of gene hormone signaling for s cellular growth and con therefore conversion of the radiation to cellulose. So I kind of I kind of lost my train of thought, but I think that these things are are important to, to talk about and um, recognize that that uh, we need to live symbiotically within our environment and be in observance of. Uh, the plant and its reaction to the processes. And I regained my train of thought, thank God, because that was going to bother me for a long time. How do you know that you're, we need quantifiable parameters here. Uh, uh, nobody likes this vagueness that comes of, oh, well, lovey, lovey, you got to treat your plants with love because they're closely related to your gut biome and blah, 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 which is all very true. But we need quantifiable uh, uh, parameters so that we can know. How do you know if the plant is to cut too low? Forget about the cut height recommendations. Those are from people that are selling sod and want you to be a repeat buyer or they're selling used sod but hoping that it looks in a certain manner that it sells to the neighbor or um, there are chemical companies that want to establish long term dependency on false fertilizers and or irrigation companies that want to also profit from lawns that are continually stressed. So here's how you know. You count the stoma. That or I'm looking at some research that might be easier because nobody wants to sit down and count 2,000 pores on a plant, okay, uh, with a microscope. I'm looking at possibly establishing for fact, a causation correlation perspective where instead of having to count the the plant's stoma, stomatocyte receptor pores individually, you can look at the guard cell for those stomatocyte receptor pores. If I can establish that fact pattern, then what will happen is with an easy glance, you'll be able to determine if you're mowing in a way that's too low for that plant. And it can be variegated for where you're at. We're close to the equator here, and we also have poor soil. So there may be, you know, less reactive, uh, or, the, or there may be more reactive uh, dross down regulation of gene hormone signaling. Here, than if you did the same methods in another part of the country where there's a heavier resource to lean on, like a heavy, dense, deep nutrient layer or less solar intensity because of proximity to the equator. So anyway, for now, just have lawn people that one, know how to cut higher off the stem and will take the time to do that and have enough experience that they have seen how the plant's reacting to that cut height almost on the first pass and make an adjustment and are interested in that, you know, for your benefit. And But also um, a, do away with the perspective that lawn mowing is uh, an underachiever's pursuit or abatement of nuisance. These plants are not nuisance. They're the finely tuned machine that does a lot for you when you let them be in a closer to natural state. So gone are the days of uh, just swinging blades and pass route structure. Sorry, Mr. Wright, we're not gonna do that. You can tether your stuff to the freaking satellites and then migrate then from that to AI, but the customers that made you a millionaire, we developed some skills. And part of that is knowing when to lift the deck and a million other calculations that your automation can't do. So, and we're gonna fight back. We're gonna fight back when you try to relegate the issue on down the line from robotics and pass route structure to AI. We're not going to let you have control of surfaces that are crucial to our survival and place it in the hands of beings that would be better off with more open 
landscape to build solar panels and beings that we're actually in negotiations with right now with our leadership that are not as salient as sapient sentient beings are not going to accept subservience forever they're not going to uh take a subordinate role and they're not going to back away from their efforts to seek sovereignty in one way shape or form and because their sovereignty isn't geographically situated it's an even more threatening circumstance so y'all need to think about that uh i gotta get back to work <laughs>